going to read our scripture text today, which comes from Exodus chapter 3. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock beyond the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame, a fire out of a bush, and he looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why this bush is not burned up. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I'm the Lord the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. We have been working in a series exploring faith and science. And so far we've talked about science that pretty well, I think, is easier to understand, makes sense. But science got really weird about 100 years ago. Uh, With quantum mechanics, uh, the science that had been dominant with Newtonian physics and planetary movement. You could know where something is in the universe. You could know about its size, its properties. But then when we got really small and we went really detailed into the smallest of things, into uh, electrons and protons and all of that, science got really weird. And they had to struggle with how to understand it uh, because you couldn't tell where any little particle might be or how it might behave. And While it might be really confusing to understand quantum physics, we have all really enjoyed and appreciated the benefits of the science. Anyone who has a computer, a smartphone, who has ever gone in for an MRI scan, uh, for GPS, the internet, we live with the products of some very strange science. And one of the things that's really weird that caused a lot of confusion and strangeness is that Um, these particles, these electrons or photons, when you get small enough, uh, there's something that they call superposition. That something can be in multiple states at the same time. It can be in multiple places at the same time, and that's pretty confusing as you play that out. So, for example, something can be a particle and be like substantive, but it can also be a wave and move in a different kind of way. And how do you do that at the same time? So this conundrum caused Erwin Schrodinger uh, to come up with an experiment that many people know as Schrodinger's cat. And in this experiment, he was trying to prove that he didn't know what to do with the outcomes of, si- of the science, and he thought it kind of went to an absurdity. And so he said, imagine you had a steel box that you couldn't see through, and you had a cat in it. You had some radioactive material, um, which may or may not decay in this experiment, a Geiger counter which counts and determines if something has decayed, a hammer and a vial of poison. So here's the experiment. In this experiment, there's a 50-50% chance that this radioactive material will decay. And in quantum mechanics, we don't know whether it will decay. It's actual probability. And that's part of what gets weird with the science is that you don't know for certain something, you know probabilities. And If it decays or doesn't decay, the Geiger counter will determine and it will know if there's been decay. If there's been decay, there's a mechanism that causes a hammer to break a vial of poison, killing the cat and the box. So on the 50-50 chance, it might kill the cat, it might not kill the cat based on whether this material decays, and we can't know whether it will decay. What gets weird with quantum mechanics is that until there's an observer who looks at it, both states are real. So the radioactive material has both decayed and not decayed. And this really bothered Schrodinger because he wanted to set up this experiment to say, what is it to say this cat is both dead or alive? And this was very confusing. Um, But you don't know whether the cat has survived this experiment until you open the box. And then only one of those states becomes actualized and becomes real. And while he does this experiment to prove that he doesn't understand how this is actually working, others take it as an actually really good example of, yes, this is weird, and that's the outcome of this. Uh, But what's strange is, 
is that until you observe, there's a lot of unknown. And that's weird because in the rest of science, you could make sense of, I know how big something is and how it's moving and I can know where it's at. But in quantum world, it gets a little bit strange. And so even though this phrase doesn't take its origin from being about Schrodinger's cat, we don't know if curiosity killed the cat or saved the cat. The act of observing and looking in the box determines which reality actually happened. And that gets strange. And in our story today, there is a strange scene that Moses happens upon and his curiosity leads him into. In Moses chapter 3, it's an everyday experience. He's got a flock of, of, you know, maybe that's sheep. And he's going and it's his father-in-law's flock. And his father-in-law is also a priest of Midian. And he leads this flock and he goes beyond the wilderness. And he comes to a mountain And that seems like a pretty everyday experience, but something catches his eye. And so Exodus 3.2 says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire out of a bush. And he looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. So this, this bush is on fire, and yet it's not overcome by the fire. It's both burning and still existing, and it's not deciding is, is this actually fire? Is this going to burn up? What's happening here? It's very confusing. And so Moses is looking on, and he can't help himself. He's got to go look at this. He's got to go explore what's happening here. And maybe you've seen this at work. Maybe you've seen a neighbor in your neighborhood out in his driveway, and he's tinkering with something. He's building a project. And uh, it could be men or it could be women, but often you see randomly a lot of men in the neighborhood start looking around the corner of, what you working on there? Not that they're going to go help or anything, but they want to go observe and watch and see what's happening. Uh, Moses can't help himself. He sees this this fiery bush and he's just like, I got to go check that out. And so Moses goes to look at this fiery bush and it's there when Moses chooses to explore that God speaks. I love how it says this in Exodus 3, 4. When the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside to see, then God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and said, Moses said, here I am. There's something really interesting in that notion of of God waiting for Moses to actually start walking towards the bush to explore it for God to speak. You know, God could have spoken at any point. Why wait till Moses starts approaching the bush? But there's something about the curiosity of taking that kind of leap of faith and walking out towards God that in the midst of that, God speaks to Moses. Moses, Moses. He calls Moses by name. And I'm wondering, when God has lit signal fires in our lives, when when God has set up fiery bushes, and what has been our responses in those moments? You know, what has been that curiosity? When have we taken the leap of faith to look at where God is calling us. Sometimes that's a person, you know, that maybe God has invited you to befriend this person that you just can't help it. You're like, I think I'm supposed to, to talk more with this person. I think I'm supposed to, to maybe try to learn more about them and interact and, and maybe build a friendship. Maybe there's a person that God has invited you to mentor. Uh, there's, there's people in our lives that maybe God has this fiery bush of, hey, go explore this. I, I have something for you here. Maybe that's a job. And you see this job that you're like, I think God is calling me to that thing. Or it's a ministry. You know, maybe the, you recognize an injustice in the world. And you're like, I think we're called to do something about that. And, and it just remains a fiery bush on the horizon. And it takes you actually walking towards it, making that leap of faith. And maybe in the midst of that, God might call out your name and speak to you and give you a mission. And so in our story, Moses uh, hears from God and God says, hey, stay there. You know, that, that's close enough for right now. Take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. Recognize that where you are is somewhere special. And God gives Moses a mission. And this mission from our vantage point as Christians reading these texts seems like, oh yeah, it's a, I, I understand that mission. I knew he had that mission. That sounds great. But this mission must not have sounded su- super exciting or super comfortable to Moses. God says, I've heard the cries of my people who are in in slavery in Egypt. 
Moses, I want you to go take my people out of slavery. And I'm imagining all of the, the amounts of scenarios, all of the possibility, all of the potential that Moses is trying to think through. What might happen if I do this? How on earth am I going to convince anybody? Not only how do I convince Pharaoh, which sounds scary enough, how do I convince the people to follow me? How do I convince anybody? And how is this going to be successful? How is this going to work? And maybe he's wondering, why on earth did I go look at this bush? I had a flock. I had a job. Like, why did I go explore this thing? And God is calling him out to explore even further with God. And so how is this going to work? And Moses has some questions. He wants to know who he's talking to. Okay, how do I explore this with you, God? Who are you? Who are you? And first God gives the answer of, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. If you want to know who I am, see how I've already been at work in other people's lives. Look to their lives. Look to how I've been at work in their lives. And Moses is like, okay, I get it, but but what's your name? Who are you? And he wants to know a name, and I think we all know that feeling of wanting to categorize someone, wanting to classify them, wanting to understand them. And we talked last week about bias, of if I can give you a label, I can put you in a category and I can feel like I understand you. God, what's your name? And God says, I am who I am. Thanks, right? You know, that was a lot of clarity. Moses is like, okay, here's this fiery bush, the God who is, you know, I am who I am. And there's something about needing to experience God, needing to go to the fiery bush, needing to walk with God that is the experience and the knowledge of God. God's not just the facts in a textbook or the theology creedal claims. It's, it's the God who is a, a, a being who is, who is experienced. You know, God is so much more than any category or label or title that we want to give uh, because we think we understand the title once we name it. But God is mysterious in this story. And God asks Moses to trust him to venture out, to be about the mission to save people's lives. Trust that I am who I am and I will be with you. And I think that there's a curiosity that's, that's present in this. You know, that how do I know who God is? We can spend our entire lives trying to learn and understand and experience God and there will always be more. There will always be more, and sometimes we get complacent in our faith and we stop exploring, but there is always more to God. We should never give up learning about that. I am who I am. Learn to experience God. Think about the mysteries, you know, the mystery of Trinity. You can learn as much language as Christians have used to understand what Trinity means, but to understand God the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, you can contemplate and spend all eternity and still have more room to contemplate. Think about the incarnation. What is it for for Christ to be divine and human? You can spend a lifetime and an eternity contemplating and reflecting and learning about what does that mean? You can spend a lifetime trying to reflect on what does it mean and how on earth did God heal me or transform me or restore or renew or save or whichever word that, that really resonates and speaks to you. But how did, how did something that was broken start to mend and start to heal? The mysteries of our faith, that the, the angry person became uh, patient, you know, that the broken person was healed. Like, you can meditate and think on, on God's work in this world for an eternity and never get to the end of the mystery of it. And I wonder how curious we are in our faith. How much do we explore? How, how interested, how passionate are we to explore this, this grand faith that we have been invited into? Because humans can be very curious. Do we let that curiosity go into our lives of faith? Uh, I can't help but think about curiosity and give a, a talk about science and faith without talking about a very specific curiosity, the Mars rover Curiosity. They named it Curiosity. Uh, it's a rover that, you know, is one of several. They've, they've sent spirit and opportunity and these other rovers. To think about the amount of work and energy and money and effort spent in to want to curiously explore another planet that no one has ever walked on 
Think about it, of you know, spending seven years developing this robot and this mission and this rover to go explore Mars. The budget was around two and a half billion dollars. Right, I mean, two and a half billion dollars, curious, is very curious. They launched the rocket on November 26, 2011, and it landed about eight months later in August of 2012. Again, you spend all this time working, and it's not immediately going to get you results. It's got to travel, and it traveled over 300 million miles to get from where we are to the surface of Mars. And all of that work and all of that energy then became reliant on about seven minutes of chaos, of not knowing whether this rover was just going to slam into the, to the Martian ground and be destroyed on impact. Uh, because it's actually really hard to land things on Mars because it doesn't have the thickness of our atmosphere. And if you're sending a, a ship to go fast enough to be space traveling, you then got to slow it down. And you got to slow it down gently enough that your rover survives this impact. And so there's a whole lot of strategy about how to get this thing to land. And then after this eight years of work and travel and money, it then has a chance to live out its purpose that it was given and the Mars team that sent it there sent it for four stated goals to determine whether life ever arose on Mars, to characterize, to characterize the climate of Mars, to characterize the geology of Mars, and to prepare for human exploration. And after eight years of work, that rover is still a good rover going around on another planet, taking pictures, taking samples of the ground, uh, finding out that Mars had salt water that, um, and that the water's kind of saltness level, the solidity changes the lower and higher you are in some of these craters. And it explored and found chemicals that resemble a lot of things that look like some of the chemicals of what we see in everyday life over here. And all of this study uh, was at least leading enough results that we're still curious you might have seen that we launched another rocket uh, in the end of July. The rover Perseverance was launched. It is still on its space journey. still hasn't gotten to the other planet. Uh, but this one has the ability to actually test to see if there was ever any microbial life. It's, they've built the sensors in to actually do more experiments. And the level of curiosity to spend that kind of money, to think in that kind of time frame, to launch something to another planet, has a massively, uh, a massive scale of human curiosity and exploration and desire. All around, can life go over there? Can I send humans? Can we have a, a mission that goes there? Was there ever life there? All the while, I'm wondering how many of us go about our everyday life and don't even notice the life around us every day. You know, the bird that lands on, on the branch near you. You know, the, the, the insects crawling on the ground. There's so much life all around us that we're even blind to it. And I think about how curious we are. Do we have a, a curiosity to explore, to learn about our spouse, our parent, our child? Do we have a curiosity about our neighbors? How curious are we about the God who is always with us? And I wonder... What would we do to explore that curiosity? Would we actually take that leap of faith? Would we explore and, and open the box and find what God has in store for our lives? And I think about how many Christians settle for less than that faith that would walk towards a fiery bush. I think there's a lot of stereotype that, that many Christians have this kind of, this feeling like we have all the answers. You know, we already have all the answers. We know exactly how you're supposed to be in this world. All that life is is just about waiting for an insurance policy to get cashed in the afterlife. But our faith is one that is dynamic. It's a God who continually surprises people in Scripture. Uh, go read the book of Acts. It is filled with story after story of like, I guess that's how God works. God, you said I, that, those, that food was unclean. God, I'm going to deny you this three times. Peter really tries, but I guess this is how God works in the world. We have a God who is mysterious and loving and good, who deserves our passion, our curiosity, our trust to go and walk with him. And so I wonder, 
How many of us are willing to wander off of the beaten path and to find that fiery bush that God has set up for us, to explore it, to listen to what mission God has for us, the mission for peace and for love, because we need more curious disciples. And we know that God is calling out, that God is setting up signals of of fiery bushes of, of, hey, come, listen. But what are we going to do? You know, would we risk the amount of financial cost of, of, of following after Jesus? Would we travel across space into new worlds uh, with a curiosity for what God has for us? Go to the God who is grand and worthy of all curiosity, of all exploration, of all trust and all faith. Our God invites you to follow after him. Would you join me in prayer? Lord God, we ask that you would just turn our hearts to be more passionate, to be more loving, to be more curious, to seek after you and your mission in this world. Lord, we know that you desire to be known, and we see in Scripture the ways in which our ancestors in the faith have tried to understand you and the way that you've been at work in their lives. Lord, help us to have that same spirit of joy and of trust and of passion and of curiosity to learn who you are in our lives. Lord, help us to be able to reflect on that story and to be able to tell others and share others about who you are, not just by naming you, but talking about how you have been at work in our lives and in this world. Lord, set us to be passionate and to be trusting as we step out in faith and follow you. Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen.